Good morning. Hello and welcome to worship. Good morning. <laughs> so glad that you are here today. I'm Pastor Lauren, and if you're visiting with us, I especially want to welcome you here to worship, whether you're joining us online or in person. Happy Valentine's Day weekend, happy Super Bowl Sunday, so many things going on today. Uh, if you are in person, attendance pads will be started in the back and come forward. Once they make it to the front row, they can stay there. If you're joining us online, please just let us know you're worshiping with us today. We'd love to know you are there. We are continuing a new worship series called This Is Us, where we're celebrating our core values as a congregation those include love, welcome, connection, discipleship, and outreach. And today we're exploring connection, which is uh, great because before worship, you all were connecting so well. So glad that you are excited to be here and to connect with one another. Uh, just a reminder, as we begin worship, during this series, we're singing a hymn that's familiar to you, Be Thou My Vision, but we're singing it instead with the pronouns of are and us to remind us that we are called to be a people who are seeking after God's vision together, not just as individuals, but as a united church family. So with that, let us worship God together. Be thou our vision, O Lord of our hearts, not be all else to us, save that thou art. Thou art best, thou art by day or by night, waking or sleeping, thy presence our light. Be thou our wisdom and thou our true word we ever with thee and thou with us lord thou and thou only first in our hearts great god of heaven our treasure thou art great god of heaven our victory won May we reach heaven's joys, O oh, bright heaven's sun. Heart of our own hearts, whatever befall, still be our vision, O oh, ruler of all. And if you'll please stand and join us in singing. We'll be singing My Hope is Built, uh, number 368, all four verses. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness fails his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. His oath, his covenant, his blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all 
all other ground is sinking sand. You may be seated. If the children would come forward, we have a special message just for you this day. Good morning. Can y'all hear me? Is it working okay? All right. Hey, well, congratulations. You know, I well know you have a you already have a little brother, didn't you? Hmm. I'm looking for Jade. Okay. We'll tell I'll tell her next time I see her. So I hear we have a new baby in the family. All right. So did y'all have a good week? Did you enjoy the Sleet and ice that we had recently? Yeah? I didn't like it after one day I was ready for it to go away. So, all right, so I have this story to tell y'all. And, but first, before I tell you the story, I want to tell you about this, how the houses were built back in the first century Palestine when Jesus lived there. And so for this story, we need to understand how the roofs were made. And let me show you that the walls of the houses were built of mud bricks and then wooden supports were laid from one side of the building to the other, resting on the walls, creating beams, which is confusing already. So let's get to have a picture. They had woven reed mats or sticks that were placed on top of the wooden beams and then layers of clay mortar were smeared on top of the mats to make a solid surface. The roofs were flat and people often did ho- household chores or stored things on the roof. And so it sounds to me like it was a pretty hard roof if you can put stuff on top of it. And here's a picture. You can see how flat it was. Yes, it did. Y'all see it? Y'all see it burning? Yep, it's a it's a really flat. It's not like the most of the roofs we have now that are slanted. Okay, so in this story, Jesus is in Capernaum, and word got out that he was staying in this house. And lots of people, you know, when Jesus, people hear that Jesus is coming, everybody wants to come see him, right? And, and hear what he has to say. So they wanted to see the teacher and the healer who was becoming really famous. And Jesus taught the people gathered about God. The house, the yard, and the street were really crowded. So there were these there was this one man though that that couldn't walk and he had four friends that wanted to bring him to Jesus cuz we've heard lots of stories about Jesus healing people, right? And so they knew they had to get their friend to Jesus. But when they got there and they had him on the stretcher cuz he couldn't walk. But when they got there, what did they see? people everywhere they couldn't get in the house can you imagine how crowded it was in the yard that's right everybody wanted to see jesus so they knew they, there was no way to get their friend in because they had him on a stretcher too so those are kind of big right and so they couldn't get jesus attention by waving through the window because he was talking and everybody was listening to him the paralyzed man was very disappointed and as were his friends. They all felt like Jesus only hoped they had him ever walking again. They all believed with all their might that if they could get in to see Jesus, he could heal him. So then one of the friends had a good idea had an idea to do this. To go up on the roof and ma- make a hole in the roof. And you remember how tough those hole the roof is, right? And cut a hole in the roof and put him down through the hole to Jesus and so that's what they did um, so it didn't take after they um, finally got up on the roof they walked up these these stairs they had that goes up to the roof um, they carried their paralyzed friend on his mat up the steps they dug a hole in the outside layer huh no that's 
um, the four friends looked through the hole after they got the hole, and down in the room below them, and who did they see when they looked in the hole in the roof? Jesus, that's right. That's who they were looking for, right? That was their main reason for digging the hole. And the disciples and others looked back up at them. It was now or never. They had to come too. They had come too far to chicken out now. So the friends lowered the paralyzed man down to the hole, and they made for Jesus and waited for him in the room below. And Jesus, uh, he wasn't angry. He was very interested in what they were doing. He wasn't uh, angry about the hole in the roof. He was not irritated that he had interrupted. They had interrupted his teaching. Uh, and he was actually impressed by the faith of the man and his friends that what they did to come to reach him. And so Jesus said, son, your sins are forgiven. That's what he said to the paralyzed man. Well, some of the people listening to Jesus thought Jesus didn't, wasn't God and said that he couldn't tell the man that, that he had forgiven his sins. But Jesus told him that he had the authority from God to make to do that. And so then he said, he said, well, I'm going to show them I really uh, am the son of God. And he said, stand up and take your mat and go home. And that's exactly what the man did. He stood up. He picked up his mat, and he began that he'd been lying on for so long and walked out the front door. What do you think people were doing then? They probably had their mouths wide open, didn't they? Yes. Amazed at what had just happened. And they, were, and they said, we have never seen anything like this. So that was a, that's a really good story. But part of the story that I wanted to mention real quick today is about the four friends. Um, how are they like our church family? They have faith in Jesus, and they know that they can heal their their broken friends. That's right. Very good. Very good. So uh, what is something else that they have in common with, with us as our church family? I'm going to, uh, one of the things that Pastor Lauren had written about or some of our goals for this year, or our core values, is um, we embrace one another and our neighbors as Christ would. Here, relationships are created, encouraged, and supported. So do you think that those four friends and the paralyzed man had a good friendship? Yeah. They had faith in each other. That guy that, uh, that was paralyzed, I bet he, he was so excited that his friends were doing everything they did to get him to, to see Jesus. So just like our church family, we would do a lot, anything for our church family, wouldn't we? Hmm? Because we love each other. Yep. All right. Okay, everybody bow your heads and let's say a prayer, okay? Kind and loving God, we too are amazed by the power and love of Jesus, which makes each of us healthy and whole. Help us to share his love with others. Amen. Thank you. If anybody wants to go to Children's Church, Kindergarten and Below, Miss Melissa's doing. you'll please stand and join us in singing Bind Us Together. The words will be on the screen. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together Lord, bind us together, Lord, bind us together with love. There is only one God, there is only one King, there is only one body. 
Our first scripture reading this morning comes from the uh, Old Testament book of Ruth, chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. In the days when judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem in Judea went to live in the country of Moab with his wife and sons. The name of the man was Imlik, and he and his and the name of his wife was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malhan and Chilion. They were Ephrates from Bethlehem in Judea. They went to the country of Moab and remained there. But Imlich, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. They took Moabite wives, and they, in the name of the, and the name of the ones were Oprah, and the other one was Ruth. When they had lived about there ten years, both Malahan and Chilion both passed away, and the woman was left with her sons and her two and her husband. The woman was left without her sons and her husband. Then she started to return with her daughters-in-laws from the country of Moab. So she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had considered his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she had been living with she and her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way back to the land of Judea. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back to you each of your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you to find security with each one of your house of your husband. She kissed them and she wept aloud. They said to her, No, we will not return. We, no, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? I do still have son, I do do I still have sons in my womb that will become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband, even if I thought there was hope for me, even if I should have a husband tonight and bear sons, would you wait with them <clears throat> until they are grown? Could you refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, it is far better for me than for you, because of the hand of the Lord has turned against me. And they wept aloud again. Oprah kissed her mother-in-law, and Ruth clung to her. So she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not press me to leave you or turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me and more more as well, even in our, even if death parts me from you. Then Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, and she said no more. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his, hearing of his word. Thanks be to God. Please join me in our con congregational prayer. God of us all, you created us to be in community with one another. Not only do you care for us, you also ask us to care for one another. We are called to celebrate with each other and to grieve with each other. Just as Ruth promised Naomi, as a com community, we commit to walk alongside one another of all circumstances. For my God is your God. Your joy is my joy. Your pain is my pain. May it be so. Amen. As we continue to think about connection, we turn to our gospel story for today, which can be found in Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Jesus has been traveling. He has called his disciples <clears throat> after he was baptized and has begun his ministry of teaching and healing. 
people have begun to know who he is and what he's up to, and we meet him in this story. When Jesus returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. So many gathered around that there were no longer room for them, not even in front of the door, and he was speaking the word to them. Then some people came, bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by, the, by four of them. And when they could not bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. <clears throat> and after having dug through it, they let down the mat on which the paralytic lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning their hearts. Why does this fellow speak in this way? Is it blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? At once Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were discussing these questions among themselves. And he said to them, why do you raise such questions in your hearts? <clears throat> Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, stand up and take your mat and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, stand up, take your mat and go to your home. And he stood up and immediately took the mat and went out before all of them so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, we ask that you would move among us this day, that you would remind us that we are called to be connected to you through our faith, through spiritual practices, but also to be connected to one another through fellowship and discipleship, that it is through your love for us that we are called to love others. And we do that through community, through a church family. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. In the U.S. qualifiers for the Winter Olympics, speed skater Erin Jackson was a shoe-in for the Olympics. She held um, records and had won the World Cup finals for speed skating, and she was thought to have a medal spot in the 500-meter race that was going to happen at the Olympics just today, actually. During the trial race, Erin slipped, which caused her to just miss qualifying for the Olympics. Her teammate and friend, Brittany Bow did qualify for the 500 meter race to represent the US. And so she immediately decided, Brittany, to give up her spot to Erin. She was gonna be able to race in other races and knew that Erin was meant to race in the 500 meter. When the two, the pair talked to reporters about this, Brittany spoke about her friendship and her loyalty to Erin. They had grown up together, they had raced together, and she spoke about the way her kindness was an act that spoke to the spirit of the Olympic Games. In the Olympics, it's not just about winning, but about the sports these athletes love and the opportunity they have to not just compete, but to watch the greatest athletes in the world compete, both as their friends and as their competition. Erin said of her friend Brittany, who gave her her spot, she is a great athlete, but now the world gets to know of her kindness, too. Just this morning at about 8.30 a.m., Erin Jackson had the opportunity to compete in the gold medal race of the 500 meter and won a gold medal for the U.S. And that would not have been possible without this friendship, this loyalty that was deeper than winning, but about love and loyalty and friendship, both to the sport and to one another. This story reminds me of the story of Ruth and Naomi. It's a connection and a commitment to one another that matters most. Brittany wanted Aaron to skate with her to be there at the Olympics and for them to be able to experience the Olympic Games together because they had both worked so hard. After trials and injuries and other unexpected hurdles, they made it through hard work and a commitment to the sport of speed skating and a commitment to one another. For Ruth and Naomi, their troubles are even more enormous than a slip-up at an Olympic race or an Olympic qualifier. Their trials are almost Job-like in the way that they pile on, stacking up one after another. First, Naomi's family has to move to a foreign place to Moab because there is a famine in Bethlehem. 
Then they get to Moab, and Naomi's two sons meet and marry women who are from Moab, foreigners and outsiders to the Israelites, people who don't normally get along. These women are Ruth and Orpah. Then Naomi's husband dies, followed by her two sons' deaths. First, Naomi lost the connections and comfort of her homeland, and now the links to her homeland, all of the men in her family, have passed away. What deep grief she must have been suffering in these moments. Carrying this grief with her, she decides to journey back to Bethlehem to go home because she's heard news that the famine is over and God has provided. She gives instructions for her daughters-in-law to return home to their families to stay in Moab so that they can be cared for. After all, being three women in biblical times on their own without a male heir to care for them didn't bode well for them. And given the wariness in Israel of marrying foreign women, Ruth and Orpah were better off staying in Moab, for they were unlikely to find another husband in Israel. Orpah concedes following Naomi's advice and returns home. But Ruth will just not leave Naomi's side. Even if Naomi wanted to shake her off, she can't. And there's reason to believe that Naomi would have liked to return home alone. After all, if Ruth stays with her, that's another mouth that she has to feed and provide for. If she returns home with a foreign daughter-in-law, she risks being marginalized even more than she already will be as a single widowed woman. There are so many logistics, so many things at play when Naomi gets home and having Ruth by her side increases the trouble. Naomi probably regarded Ruth's stubborn loyalty as one big pain in the neck. Yet Ruth's steadfast commitment and loyalty to Naomi wins out. And these two women rely on and care for one another in the days to come and for all of their life. But Ruth doesn't just plan to tag along with Naomi. Instead, she makes a commitment to her through vows that we often hear read at weddings. And yet, these vows between Naomi and Ruth are more than just between two people who are in love and plan to marry. These are vows that speak to a deep connection and commitment that we are all called to have to one another in the church. After all, when the church is at its best, It is when people remember that we don't just make a commitment to God, but to one another. Ruth says to Naomi, do not press me to leave or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. There will I be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me and more as well, if even death parts me. From you. This is such a powerful word of commitment for Ruth to make. She became committed indefinitely to her mother in law, but also to the God of Israel. Not the faith that she had been raised in or the way that her friends and family would believe, but instead taking on Naomi's faith as well. Their covenant to one another was a matter of care for one another through joy and grief struggle and celebration, and they would live out their lives together as friends, as family, as faithful followers of God. What a beautiful picture of community that is melded together through God's desire for us to be connected to one another. The thing, though, about being connected to each other as people of faith is that we actually have to be vulnerable with one another. We have to share what's going on in our lives with one another. We have to ask others how they're doing. Ruth and Naomi lived through a lot of challenging times together. They intimately knew the lines of grief that stretched across one another's face. They understood the heartbreaks of traveling to Bethlehem as widows. They held each other's pain, and they were the key to one another's healing. We have to share our hardest moments with one another to really be connected. For the church isn't a place where we can come and hide our worst selves, including our downtrodden, grieving, sacred, scared, frustrated selves. Because God can handle it, and we're in this together. And we all belong here as God's children. Not because we're whole or perfect, but because we're all broken and need each other 
to help us put the pieces back together. That's what I love about this story of the friends who bring their friend who was paralyzed to Jesus for healing. They want to help put the pieces back together for their friend who is experiencing brokenness. Imagine this. Donna painted such a good picture earlier with the children's sermon. Jesus has returned home to his home base in Capernaum, probably Peter's house. People heard he was back in town, and they want to hear his teaching, see what the fuss is all about. So the house is filled to the brim with people who want to listen. People who are listening outside the house, maybe through the windows or an open door. And yet, four people know that their friend needed help. They knew his needs intimately. He was paralyzed and possibly spent every single second of his life on a mat, unable to move, unable to care for his family or to follow his dreams and passions. And these friends knew they had to get him to Jesus, the one who could help with this need. Seeing that they can't get in, they begin to dig through the roof, creating not just a little hole, but a space big enough to place a man on a mat through the roof and at Jesus' feet. They dug through mud and straw around wooden beams to find a way to Jesus, not letting any barriers or boundaries get in the way of their friend's need. When the man is in front of Jesus, Jesus accepts this interruption as he often does, and turns it into a moment of ministry, a moment of compassion. And seeing this man's four friends and their collective faith, he offers healing to the man in need. Those four, friend, four friends were just doing what they thought was right. What they thought needed to be done. But I wonder if they had any idea when they started that day what impact their faith would have on the life of their friend. They gave him not just healing through Christ, but New life, too. New possibilities. New ways of living out his faith in the world. The collective faith of these four friends led to transformation through Christ. And this is the story of the church. This is what we're after here at Valonia United Methodist Church. That our collective faith and our commitment to knowing the joys and needs, the good news and the bad news of those who sit in this worship center with us, who worship online with us, who serve on committees or volunteer alongside us, who teach your children or youth in Sunday school and on Wednesdays, that our collective faith and commitment would know those people, their needs, their cares, so that Christ might transform each of us because we are connected to one another. We make a commitment through baptism and communion through our two sacraments, that we will help each other to grow in faith. When someone is baptized, we say we will commit to helping to raise them in the faith. When we receive communion, as we did last week, we ask God that he would make us one with Christ and one with each other and one in ministry to all the world. We're called to connection, to commitment, to vulnerability, to bring our whole selves to ask for help, to let people know when we've fallen. And I know sometimes we're afraid to do this. We're embarrassed or we feel ashamed about what's going on in our lives. But if we don't share the moments of despair and sadness with one another, we can't celebrate the moments of transformation either. We then don't get to say, look what God has done. Friends, our calling as a church is to be part of a place where people feel connected, where people know the needs of one another, like the friends of the man who was paralyzed, or like Naomi and Ruth, people who commit and say, we're going to walk through the muck with you. We're going to celebrate the wins with you. For your God is my God. Your joy is my joy. Your pain is my pain. Social worker and author Brene Brown tells a story of how she prepared her children who were going into elementary school for the struggles that might come up for them when they're dealing with friends and with this struggle to connect with others. She told them, you have a flame in you. And Brene Brown is a Christian, so maybe in this moment as she's telling the story, she's not thinking about it from that specific perspective, but I think we can think about this flame as the light of Christ in us. 
She had her kids cup their hands, and she said, you have a flame in you, and that's your spirit. And you have to protect that flame. When things get stormy and windy, you want friends who come and cup their hands over that flame to help protect it so that your spirit doesn't go out. And when the flame gets really big because you win the spelling bee or you get the part in the play, you don't want friends that blow out that flame, blow out that spirit because they think your light is too bright. We are people called to protect the flame in one another, to protect the light of Christ in one another, to protect each other's spirits, to help each other in the stormy times and celebrate when people's light is shining so bright. When have you felt connected to God through others at this church? How have you been loved through connection? How have you made a commitment with, to connect with others in our congregation? I invite you at this time, if you would join me in saying our core value of connection. It will be on the screen and it's in the middle panel of your bulletin. Let us read it together. We embrace one another and our neighbors as Christ would. Here, relationships are created, encouraged, and supported. Connection is what drives us as people of faith, and we're invited to see the light of Christ in one another so that transformation and healing, love and joy and hope can spread, not just among us here at this church, but out into the community out into the places that we go, taking that light that encourages connection. For when all of our lights are shining bright, Christ's love and light shines brightest of all. May it be so. Amen. and worship we will uh, affirm our faith in the as is written in the old and new testaments i believe the god the father almighty maker of heaven and earth and in jesus christ his only son our lord who was conceived by the holy spirit born of the virgin mary suffered under pontius pilate was crucified dead and buried on the third day he arose from the dead he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall have judged the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You can be seated. At this time, we enter into an attitude of prayer, first hearing the request of our faith community and our world, and then you'll be invited into a time of silent prayer. Um, concerns include prayers for Andrea Stitt, who has post-traumatic eye damage from a sports injury from a little alumni lacrosse playing last weekend. <laughs> prayers for Julie Walker's sister, Nancy, and continued prayers for Lucy Roberts and family. Joys include uh, prayer, or a celebration for a new baby. John David Stitt arrived on Wednesday, and all are doing great. We have an excited aunt and Andrea and grandparents and David and Janine, so we're excited to welcome John David into the world. At this time, I invite you into an attitude of prayer. You can stay in your seats. You can kneel at the altar rail or light a candle if you would like to. I invite you at this time to think about... Um, how God has led you to connect with others through faith or through church. Was there a mentor or someone who helped you to feel connected or someone in this congregation? Maybe give thanks for those who you feel connected to through your faith. Let us pray.
Let us pray. God, you created us to be in relationship with one another. From the beginning of our faith story, you desired that Adam not be alone. So you provided him with a partner, a companion, a friend, and Eve. Thank you for the friendships and connections we've made through Christ and through our faith. We thank you for mentors and family and friends who have taught us what it is to love Christ and to love one another. And we pray that we would not take these relationships for granted. Loving God, you have reconciled us in Christ Jesus and have given us the ministry of reconciliation. We pray for all those from whom we are estranged. Bring healing to strained or broken relationships. Forgive us for the times we have wronged others, whether by ignorance or neglect or intention. Grant us the courage and the grace to seek their forgiveness and opportunities to make amends. Where others have wronged us, grant us a gracious spirit that we might forgive even as we have been forgiven in Jesus Christ. Lord, we lift up the prayers for others in our community and in our midst. We often are carrying grief and heaviness with us when we come to worship. We know family members or loved ones who are ill, those receiving treatment, those waiting for news from doctors. Lord, fold your arms around those in need or full of questions and doubt. We pray for those who are caregivers, those taking care of loved ones who are ill, for the work that they do to be companions to those in need of compassion. Lord, we ask that you would help us to be a family of faith who sees the needs not just of those in our community, but of Bologna as a town as well. That we might continue to be people who care for those in need of food. For we might support and encourage students at our schools and teachers and administrators, Lord. We pray that your hope might surround all of those in this community that they might feel your presence, that each person's light might shine and not be diminished through your love and through our connections with one another. Lord, as we prepare for the giving of our tithes and offerings, we ask that you would remind us that these moments of offering are moments for us to give back to you for the blessings that you have given us. We thank you for the ways that Ruth and Naomi that the friends carrying their paralyzed friend on a mat were committed to one another and to your love and your work. And we pray that through our gifts, our tithes and offerings, we might be committed to connecting with others, to loving others, and to knowing the needs of our, those in our midst. And now let us join together in the prayer that our Savior taught us as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Before our offering moment, we're going to have a short video. Each week we've been highlighting the ways that your gifts, um, your prayers, your presence, your financial gifts, your service, and your witness help us to, we'll get to that in just a second, uh, help us to live out our calling as a church. So today as we think about connection, we're going to hopefully hear from Jean Cure and Clint Johnson. And I want to give you a little bit of background before we jump into that because um, the great thing about being United Methodist is that we're not just called to connect to one another at our local church, but instead we get to connect with United Methodists all around the state and the country and the world. And you'll hear from Jean, who is the chair of our church family life team, and many of you see her often, I uh, filmed her video in the kitchen because that's often where we find her, and she helps with a team of people at our church to help us to connect with each other in the church. And then we're going to hear from Clint Johnson, who um, is not only committed and connected in our church as our lay leader,
But he also, um, like many of you, is connected across the conference. Clint serves on the board for Mount Eagle, which is a United Methodist Retreat Center in Clinton. He works with Ozark Mission Project, a youth mission project for our state that's connected to the Methodist Church. And he also helps with Boy Scouts of America, the pack that meets at our church. And so we're thinking about not just how we're called to connect with each other, but how we're called to connect with people all around the state. Uh, they had a lot to say, and I didn't want you to have to hear all of that today. So <laughs> we're going to just hear a little bit uh, this morning. But I do, I'll do i post on Facebook the next couple of days their full videos, and I do hope you'll watch them because uh, they, it was a great uh, conversation and way for you to hear about how they're connecting. And I am um, the chairperson of the Church Family Life Team. The Church Family Life Team is a totally volunteer group. I'm the only person on that team who is appointed by the board. We have a great team and they work very hard to plan fellowship activities that are comfortable for everyone in our church. Activities that encourage us to interact, connect with each other on a level that's totally different from when we are in the worship service. Of course, as good Methodists, we often connect with food. Hospitality and fellowship are an essential part of our faith. When we are blessed, we want to share our blessings. That is what God wants us to do. He wants us to connect with each other, and not just with our church family, but with our community family too. We're filled with goodness every time that we come together. We're known as a giving church, and we are very glad to share our bounties with our community. Hi, I'm Clint Johnson, and I'm the lay leader at Bologna United Methodist Church. So I, I guess I've never thought about this uh, until you asked me this question, but the organizations that I'm part of, Ozark Mission Project, um, Scouts, and uh, Mount Eagle, those are places that people go to belong to a community. And we're living in a world that, that tries to pigeonhole us, to divide us, to put us into categories. And, you know, COVID's made that even worse in the last two years. We've been isolated and we've been, you know, further um, divided. And God's call for us is to live out what creation was supposed to be, to be a, a loving, forgiving, grace-filled place that is um, a community that's connected to God and connected to one another. And um, in, in those, those communities, um, th those are places where people go for an identity. When, when we're in those communities um, of all bunch of different people, we realize that we're, we're all a bunch of uh, flawed, imperfect people um, that have differences. But the closer we get to one another, we realize that um, though we have differences, we're more um, on a spectrum rather than being a, a polar opposites. So we're, we're a lot closer um, than we thought and even in, in the ways that we're different. And we find that we have um, common ground in, in ways that we didn't know we would. So like I said, they had much more to say, so I hope you'll check those videos out of other, uh, Jean talks about her favorite church family life memory and Clint talks about um, how he's able to use his gifts to connect across um, these organizations he's a part of. As you give today, I hope uh, you give with a sense of understanding of how we are connected, not just to one another, but to others all across the state and the world through Christ. At this time, I invite our ushers and greeters to come forward as we give of our tithes and offerings.
Please stand for the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God all creatures here below. Alleluia, alleluia. Praise God the source of all our gifts. Praise Jesus Christ whose power uplifts. Praise the Spirit, Holy Spirit. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. If you'll remain standing for our final song, we'll be singing uh, One Thing Remains. The words will be on the screen.
Amen. Friends, um, if you'll uh, just if you haven't noticed in your bulletin, there's a calendar of events for today, and it is long and shows us what it looks like to be a church in connection. So there's an SPR meeting um, at 11:15, Valentine dinner pickup from 2 to 4 p.m. Or if you're asked for delivery, you'll get that delivered during that time. If you didn't sign up for a meal and would like one, if you would talk to Jean after the service, you saw her on the video. Um, she's on the back row here. Um, there are a few meals left to be reserved, so you can do that as well. And then also, United Methodist Women is meeting at 2.30 today in room 101. This is another great way to connect, not just in our local church, but across the district and the conference of our United Methodist Church. The United Methodist Women work to care for women and children and youth. And so if you'd like to join them, you can talk to Melissa Freeman, and they'll be meeting at 2.30 today, or just show up for that meeting. As we um, go from this place, I wanted to share a few other ways that you can pray, serve, and give through connection. Uh, through prayer, you can ask God to direct you towards a person in our congregation that you can connect with and build a new relationship with. You can serve on the Church Family Life team. Uh, it is truly a team that has a lot of fun uh, organizing and uh, serving us through fellowship. You can also give by making a donation to United Methodist Committee on Relief, also known as UMCOR, which helps people to recover from natural disasters in our country and around the world. They're often the first on the ground during disasters. Donna and David Johnson often uh, work with UMCOR and help serve in that way. So one thing that we are good at as Methodists is connecting with one another. So let us continue to do that. Let us trust that God has called us to create relationships here and around any place that we go because Christ's light shines in us and we're called to share that with others. Go in peace. Amen.